This is Mill Street Radio from PRX, and I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Today it's our episode about grocery stores, how they work behind the scenes, what sells and what doesn't, plus the rise of the superstore. In 1956, when the first American-style supermarket opens overseas in Rome, people were shrieking with delight. A woman started running up and down the aisle screaming, this must be heaven. We'll also find out what new products we'll be seeing in the upcoming year. I actually did this whole deep dive on the rise of like spiritual beverages and snacks. So like, you know, instead of a shaman, you have Erewhon. <laughs> Stories from the supermarket. First up, we're visiting the freezer aisle. Pull up a chair, America. Sit right down there, America. Swanson's cooking just for you. So the question is, how did TV dinners change the world? I'm joined now by Jeff Swiston. He's author of TV Dinners Unboxed, The Hot History of Frozen Meals. Jeff, welcome to Milk Street. Wow, what a pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. There were a number of things going on sort of mid-20th century that led up to this invention of and surge in TV dinners. What what were some of the things going on in, in the culture at the time? Yeah, you know, macro level, you had the baby boom, you had prosperity, uh, all those things that we sort of note about the 50s. I, I really like discovering through the the research that, you know, we sort of have romanticized and I idealized the, the 1950s as sort of happy days and all that stuff. But you know what? Uh, people were stressed. Uh, there was the Cold War. Uh, there was the keeping up with the Joneses. And what really the TV dinner hit upon was people not only were stressed, they were time pressed. And the TV dinner promised right out of the gate and continues to be speed, ease, and convenience. And so that's what, uh, you know, largely Americans, but other chunks of the world glommed onto. Here was this thing that could be ready in 30 minutes, three different chunks of food, a meat, a couple of vegetables. And people were astounded by the science of it, that, that three different things could heat up to the same temperature, uh, have the same consistency, and uh, no fuss, no muss. With Swanson TV turkey dinners, you just heat and serve, and you serve big and hearty slices of moist, tender Swanson turkey with grand giblet gravy and special cornbread dressing and fluffy whipped sweet potatoes with golden Swanson butter. Mm, Mm, Mother Murphy, lucky (laughs) me. My wife uses Swanson TV turkey dinners. Yeah, and there's a direct line back to the late 19th century when there was a movement to get women out of the kitchen by having sort of uh, community kitchens that would produce food. And women, I, I guess in your research, found that they were spending four hours per day cooking food and cleaning up. So that that was a consistent problem for a very long time, which this would evidently solve. Also, also you also mentioned, this is fascinating, food was three times more expensive than it is today. And so cost was also a factor, right? It, it definitely was, but I, I was astounded by that too, Chris, that um, roughly when Swanson sort of hit, and they were, of course, the you know the big one, the Coke of the industry, so to speak, and then you had Banquet that was the pe- Pepsi of the industry, but you know, 98 cents was roughly the, the pricing around the mid-50s uh, when Swanson was really at its height, selling about, you know, within two years of production, selling 25 million of these things a year. And if you actually did the inflation check on that, which I did, it would put these dinners at around $11 equivalent in you know, 1954, 55. But if you go and buy a Swanson TV dinner today, it's about a third of that or half yeah. that. So it was really, really more expensive. And uh, so people were willing to pay for um, the convenience of it. In 1942, you report on a Seagram's ad that was uh, futuristic, talking about what was coming down the road. Deluxe service for tomorrow's homes, cooked to order meals, brought right to the door, piping hot on time, ordered a day ahead for weekly menus, et cetera, et cetera. So although the TV dinner is slightly different than this, that idea of having meals piping hot, easily prepared, and you could choose, uh, yeah, I, I think choice also was a big thing here, right? If you could choose among lots of different things, that that was actually predicted right during the Second World War. 
You know, I love that campaign. I, I used to work on Madison Avenue for a big agency, and I, I came across that campaign. So Seagram's did this. It was, you know, to sell their uh, their liquor, but it was predicting the future from 1942. And my God, were they accurate. You know, the, they got the cell phone. They got plant-based products that would substitute meat. They, they hit all on that. Yeah, and they hit on this one. But Chrissy mentioned choice, and... TV dinners did that. TV dinners introduced much of America to Asian food, specifically, you know, Swanson's take on Chinese food. Um, and, but we saw that through the, the 60s, too. The Mexican dishes, they had to temper the, uh, the hotness of traditional Mexican food uh, so it, you know, conformed or, or was uh, fine with American palates at the time. But really, TV dinners were the ones that introduced international cuisine to the majority of the country. Well... Yeah, some version of international cuisine, but I yeah, take your no, point. No, I'm, be, I'm being generous yes, in my description. Very here. generous. <laughs> they take you away from the everyday To a world where the food makes you want to stay Those real sensational International frozen dinners from Swanson So lots of other companies started doing this. How did Swanson's just beat the competition because they got out their first in, in mass production? Is that what happened? I, I think um, it was a couple of things. One, Swanson had been kind of a creamery uh, or meat supplier. They already had like kind of the distribution contracts. And I, I believe they had initially, like you could make all the jokes you want about TV dinners overall, and I'm pretty sure I've heard them all. But back then, when you look at what they were producing, it wasn't this sort of really mass produced stuff. It almost looked like an artisan meal. You know, the meat looked like it had been hand carved. Um, so there was quality to it as well. But really, they could get out because they had distribution. And for the first year, they sold something like, you know, 5,000 or 30,000 units, and, and they were encouraged. The next year, they sold 10 million. Mm. The year following, 25 million. And literally, uh, you know, this is a company that it was doing about 70 million in sales back then, which was, you know, very respectable uh, across all of their different businesses. But Campbell saw them and bought them in 1955 in an all-stock deal. They just went, the TV dinner is the future, and, you know, Campbell's owned them for decades. So if someone hired you today to sell the concept of an updated TV dinner, however you want to package that, how would you go about selling it? So if you handed me the brief today and said, you know, we've got a, a new product, we really want to break out, we want to hit the same sort of numbers that, that Swanson had at the beginning, you got to hit on a few things. I think this is a fist. This is five fingers coming together. And I'm, I'm kind of doing this off the top of my head, but it, it's got to be, you got to speak to the, the healthy ingredients. You got to speak to the exotic nature that you couldn't prepare this at home by yourself. Kind of like the meal kit positioning. Uh, you're not going to have dishes. You're going to have it in a short period of time and it's going to taste good. That would be, you know, the marketing fist on that product. That's the way I would approach it. And you'd have to package it in a way that feels upscale and exciting, et cetera. Yeah, I th you know, really, it, it's funny, ConAgra, um, the ConAgra CEO said, you, you cannot diminish the naming of a product, the importance of it, and the packaging of it. And the um, brand Le Menu that came out in the 80s, I love Le Menu. Um, my mom went back to work in the 80s. I was just finishing high school. She was a fantastic cook. And all of a sudden she was gone, right? She was back in the workforce and our freezer was full of Le Menus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, to feed my brother and I, the two left at home. Uh, but Le Menu at the time was selling for like 12 bucks. And I think you were paying about five out of the 12 bucks for the plate. It was like a Corel plate that you would buy almost like for picnics. It was of that quality, mm. but reusable. Le candlelight, the music, the flowers, the menu. Oh, the menu. The breast of chicken parmigiana, succulent and tender with zesty tomato sauce. And they had sirloin tip one was one of the, the entrees. They were absolutely fantastic. But it also highlighted, you know, a great lament with TV dinner aficionados around the time the microwave came in. People really thought that they went downhill with the microwave and for obvious reasons that things didn't heat to the same consistency. People wanted to put their aluminum one in the oven for the 30 minutes because it really came out better. It was better tasting, better consistency uh, versus the zapping that we all did. Well, there's another 
answer for that, which is that it's 30 minutes of cocktail hour. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Put in right. the oven, you got 30 minutes for your cocktail. Maybe that helps organize your evening. <laughs> Je- Jeff, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great fun for me, too. Cheers. That was Jeff Swiston. His book is TV Dinners Unboxed. Now it's time to answer your cooking questions with my co-host, Sarah Moulton. Sarah is, of course, the star of Sarah's Weeknight Meals on Public Television, also author of Home Cooking 101. So, Sarah, so when you go to the supermarket, uh, have you come across anything that, you know, just blew you away? That was just really a fabulous new product? Yes. Fire roasted corn. It's fantastic. Is this frozen? Yes. Really? So I'm a big fan of frozen vegetables anyway, or some, some, let's put it that way. But this fire roasted corn is really good. Highly recommend. Why are you whispering? Because I'm so excited. (laughs) Okay. Uh, The other thing that I've discovered that I like, and you know, Greek friends or cookbook authors and chefs have embraced it, or mostly home cooks, frozen spinach, not the chopped up kind. I've also found the whole leaf frozen. Mm. And you know, you have to squeeze out the liquid, which I do in my ricer. Hold on, hold on. You had me with the fire roasted corn. You don't have me with frozen spinach. Why isn't fresh spinach better than frozen? Because the frozen's already been shrink wrapped. I mean, you know, you know how you take a huge bag of spinach and you cook it down, it's yeah. maybe enough for one. Right. But when you buy it frozen, it's essentially already They blanched it already. Yeah. Or well, whatever. Or by freezing it, it's reduced. You know, also again, it's at the height of its freshness. It's a beautiful color. You barely have to cook it. I mean, not that you would have hmm. anyway. And it's great in recipes like spanakopita or, you know, some sort of pie, or I throw it into soups. So it's a nice ingredient to have in the freezer. Yeah. So those are two of my new favorites. Well, you got me with at least one of them. Okay. (laughs) I can't imagine which one. Can't imagine. Let's take a call. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? David Shea. Hi, David. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Huddleston, Virginia. How can we help you today? Well, this is a return call. Oh. I called earlier and asked for some advice on baking a carrot cake. Okay. And after our call, I concluded the recipe was fine. And although I did buy a new double oven, that wasn't the problem. It was user error, plain and simple. All right. Well, can you just, you know, refresh our memory about what was the problem with this carrot cake and what we advised? Oh, sure. The problem was it really came out soupy, although the edges looked like they were almost Oh, yeah. I remember this call. Yeah. Yeah. The center was a mess. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think I was relying more on the doodness of the outer edges than the middle. So I just did the tried and true test. I ignored the outer edges, and I stuck a fork in the middle. You followed the instructions. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't ever follow the directions, No, man. no, but, Come but, on. No, but here, here's the thing, Dave. I tell people the first time you make a recipe, follow it exactly Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's counterintuitive to what you know, Chris is going to disagree with me on this one. But sometimes, and this <laughs> came from years of testing recipes of home cooks at Gourmet Magazine, sometimes mm-hmm. those people know something you don't just because they've done a trial and error. Sure. You need to start by following the recipe yeah. exactly, yeah, and, and, and then you can depart from and, the text. And sometimes the person who wrote the recipe is a complete idiot. Idiot, of course. And if you follow the recipe, <laughs> I did a soccer tour, I won't say who wrote the recipe, and she had you melting chocolate and then adding a bunch of water to it <gasps> and so i was going like this does not look good because you had water to chocolate, chocolate it seizes. seizes and i had sure. about 30 dollars worth of chocolate in that pot and i added oh. the water and it seized <laughs> but <laughs> you know yes i agree in general but you also have yeah. to use common sense so what happened then davis you just cooked it longer so i did you know and they also give you Sometimes it's like a 10-minute range of how long you cook it. But again, I was really relying primarily on the fork in the middle. And, I, you know, when it gets near the end of the range, I keep an eye on it. And I will tell you, since then, I have made three carrots and one red velvet cake, and they Mm. were pretty dang good. Well, yay. What what happened? Wait a minute. What happened to red velvet cakes? Red velvet cakes is one of my favorite cakes of all time. It's like nobody... It's in the maybe midst of culinary history. Maybe it's the red food dye. Well, well, You know, truthfully, when I made mine, I didn't quite put enough in it. I mean, it was good, 
but it wasn't that deeper red color. And my wife, I wouldn't have made it, but it's one of her favorite cakes. Too. Well, you, you can make it. There's something called cochinella. It's an insect that it's been used for mm-hmm. red coloring. So you can get a natural mm-hmm. version of that. Oh, that's cool. Now, now let, let me ask one of the questions. Did you end up changing the oven temperature so it's a little lower, or you just went with the recipe? Uh, you know, I went with the recipe. They okay. all say 350. Yeah, that sounds right. You know, I went back and I looked at a few recipes real quick, and it's like, it's not the recipe. I have a standard cake recipe. Oh, one quick thing. You talked about seasoning chocolate a few years ago on a Food Network show. There was a woman in the last round making dessert, and she was from England. And she was making melting chocolate, and it seized up. Now, I don't know how much, but she said, I know the solution, and she poured honey in it. Interesting. And it worked, and she actually won. (laughs) Oh, wow. Well, that's a happy story. But your story is a happy story, too, there, Dave. I just got to say, though, give you credit. You're one of the few people who've called in and said it was user error. That it, yeah, because blame you. yeah, blame your spouse, blame your kids, blame, blame the, the recipe, oven. blame the talk show host. Yeah, but you actually you know? <laughs> took credit. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, we that's, applaud you for that's all ref- of that. Very yes. refreshing. Okay, well, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I thank you for your help. Yeah. Okay. And good luck with the red velvet too. Yes. Yeah. All right. Take care. Yes, sir. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Steve from Kittery Point, Maine. How can we help you? Yeah, so like a lot of people during the pandemic, I took on a new hobby and I started making my own yogurt. Mm-hmm. I had an Instant Pot, so it's super easy. I found a culture, a yogurt culture I like. My wife found milk from a local farm here. Great. And so we started making it and it was super easy, consistent, and I'd strain it to make it a little thicker. A couple of times, I couldn't get access to this local milk. And so I'd go to a grocery store and just buy a name brand. And it just didn't work. It would be like kind of milk-like consistency, so pretty thin, but it never set fully. And so I just started wondering, what's the difference? And the only thing I could point to was this local milk was pasteurized, and the store brand was highly or ultra-pasteurized. Yeah. And so I was wondering if that was the issue. Well, they should take all the ultra-pasteurized milk and throw it out. I mean, it's just <laughs> awful. Years ago, milk killed people, right? Because it can go bad. Sure. There's a reason for it, and it's a health reason, and it'll keep a long time. Besides the flavor problem, I have heard that ultra-pasteurized milk in particular is problematic. You know, it's all about the proteins in the milk getting denatured. It's sort of like, you know, a tangle or a nest of dried pasta, right? And then you cook it, and it all untangles, and then it can reconnect, right? The casings denature, they relax, and they reconnect to form a structure, which makes something thick, like a custard or yogurt. Also, we're using whole milk, I would assume, when you bought it at the supermarket? Yeah. Yeah. My guess is the fat content of the milk you were buying for the farm probably is even better. But it's something about heat and casein and protein and something's going on there, so it's hard for it to come back together to create that essentially gel. Sarah? Yeah, I agree. I mean, ultra-pasteurized milk is heated to a really high temperature for only a couple of seconds, but it's like 280? 280, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so that really changes its nature. Also gives it sort of a cooked cheese (laughs) taste. I've had problems also with ultra-pasteurized cream and trying to whip Uh, it and having it go to butter before it ever becomes cream. So I think we agree with you that you've isolated the culprit. It's the ultra-pasteurized milk, so you got to just avoid that. You know, I grew up on raw milk. It has a taste, And if you buy even pasteurized milk, it's not much flavor in it either. And my guess is I wouldn't make yogurt unless I could get really good milk, right? What's the point? Yeah, Yeah. I agree. So I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm lucky that I got this pasteurized milk. If I would have failed the experiment the first few times, I probably would have given up and not made yogurt. Right. I mean, real yogurt is phenomenal. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Thank you for taking the call. Love your show. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. This is Mill Street Radio. If you're having trouble in the kitchen, Sarah and I are here to help. Please ring us anytime, 855-426-9843. That's 855-426-9843. Or just email us at questions at MillStreetRadio.com. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hi, this is Terry from Virginia. How are you? Good. How about you all? Pretty good. How can we help you? I had a question about aprons Mm -hmm. and how long with heavy use, they should typically last. 
I'm uh, I am here. I'm uh, Carrie's husband, Daniel, and I am the primary <laughs> cook in the family. And I am the one who is pretty quickly destroying every apron that we get. So we're trying to settle just how long these aprons should be lasting. I think I've gone through about four in the past five years. So we're just kind of trying to settle a debate about if that's unreasonable or not. Well, I mean, the first question is, what kind of apron are you buying? If they're made out of flour sacks, I guess they wouldn't last. But I mean, there are two kinds that will last essentially forever, like a wax cotton, right? The kinds of things you buy, like a British hunting jacket or something. I have one like that, and I don't think you could destroy that no matter what you cook like. And the other is a leather. There's a place that makes leather aprons, and that's not going to fall apart. If not, then just get a really, really super heavy, almost canvas-style fabric. Let me just ask, when you cook, (laughs) what are you doing (laughs) to destroy these aprons? I work from home and love to cook, and I'll say that I am in this these aprons, you know, several, maybe two hours a day <laughs> on oh, really? average. I've had a, a variety of aprons. I've had a few durable uh, Chef's Works ones. I think I had one of the Milk Street KAF ones, which right. was my favorite. But, you know, all of them sort of uh, eventually got holes in the front of them. I mean, I don't know. How, how often are you washing them, Carrie? Probably not as often as I should. <laughs> I think maybe a couple weeks. They just go through on their own or with rags, you know, I'm not bleaching or anything. You could look at it differently. You know, the other point of view is you're basically saying an apron lasts a year, right? You've gone through four aprons in a few years, something like that. Yes. That's not so bad. If you're expecting it to last five years, maybe it's your expectations (laughs) that are the issue here. It's not the apron. Yeah. No, let let me ask a question. Your husband does all the cooking or most of the cooking? Most of the cooking, but with a capital M. <laughs> and he does the dishes, too. I acknowledge I'm being Jeez. spoiled. Buy him an apron every birthday. Well, and, and I'll say this. Carrie is about to have our fourth child, so uh, she puts in oh. more than enough work around here. I should it say is. so. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep going through these aprons, too. Yeah, you, okay. you got off easy. You yeah. did, actually. <laughs> now I'm switching gears here, yeah. yeah. It's more uh, a debate we were having about how often with the typical use one does go through them. I was wondering if the aprons that you all use in your recipe development that are getting used all day, every day, or if those got... They get trashed. We end up okay. with dozens and dozens of them. For two hours a day to use one apron for a whole year is great. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Perfectly so. fine. All right, guys. <laughs> <Okay>. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Coming up, the story of the world's first supermarket and much more. That's in just a moment. This is Milk Street Radio. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. My next guest is Benjamin Lohr. He's the author of The Secret Life of Groceries, The Dark Miracle of the American Supermarket. Benjamin, welcome to Milk Street. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Um, Grocery stores, supermarkets, you have some terrible things to say about them. (laughs) You have some really interesting things to say about them. So let's go back early on to the early 19th century. You make the case that cardboard, and corrugated cardboard in particular, had a lot to do with the growth or the invention of the supermarket. Yeah, Uh, I mean, the revolution in packaged goods that happens in the mid-19th century really changes everything. And and you don't really think of cardboard boxes being the stuff of revolutions, but this is like, we're talking invention of the wheel type stuff for the gateway to modern society here. Suddenly you have a way of making small, individuated products. And prior to that, grocery stores existed in bulk. It was all giant barrels of dried fruit that the grocer would chisel out from behind his counter. Uh, And then along comes the individual container, and it really shifts how consumers interact with goods. And, And this is not just cardboard. There's innovations in canning, in glass, and when you have individual products, they need a name on them. They need some type of identity, and that really gives birth to the brand 
and gives birth to the idea of a consumer who goes in looking for a particular item. You're not looking for crackers. You're looking for Uts. You're looking for Nabisco. And you point out, this is amazing, in 1900, Nabisco is selling more than 100 million boxes of Unita biscuits a year. Yeah, and You Need a Biscuit comes from this possibly apocryphal story where Robert Gare from Brooklyn invents the first automated cardboard box uh, distribution center. And Nabisco comes to him with these biscuit products and he goes, you need a name for these biscuits. And they don't (laughs) think that this is an important thing. So they just slap the name Unita onto the box and it goes on to be what you just said, this humongous blockbuster product. So because people could suddenly ask for something by name instead of just getting biscuits. It's interesting, though, if, if you look at studies, time and time again, they tell us that we think we want choice, but some of the happiest yeah. people in the world are the people with the least amount of choice. Oh, 100%. And like if you came from Russia, you know, mid-century or even back in the 80s or 90s, and you show up at a supermarket, you know, like Khrushchev did <laughs> one time, and the 30,000 or 40,000 SKUs would be confusing. Oh, 100%. Look, I think you hit the nail on the head with the disorientation that this world produces. When people walked in the first generally recognized like first supermarket, this is 1930 in Queens, a gentleman named Michael Cullen opens this thing up. It's only 6,000 square feet. It's tiny. Like right now you have 100,000 square foot superstores. But so this 6,000 square foot, when people first walked in, they complained about being dizzy from the options. Housewives would turn to their husbands and say, I'm going to faint. These are like from press reports. Um, Mm. There was a sense of overwhelm. In 1956, when the first American style supermarket opens overseas in Rome, this is again, straight from press reports. People were shrieking with delight. A woman started running up and down the aisle screaming, this must be heaven. And, you know, the Pope a few days later makes an announcement from the Holy See on this like miraculous thing. So disorientation and overwhelm are exactly, one, what the store constructors were going for, but two, what was created. So you present two sides of the supermarket. I guess the argument here is on one hand, the supermarket American supermarket is an amazing concept with anywhere from 10,000 to 50 or 60,000 SKUs. Uh, you get relatively fresh food. You're not probably getting poisoned too often. It's an amazing thing. On the other hand, there is a real dark side. So let's start with the dark side. Well, the dark side of this supermarket is that it really reveals a lot of our what I would call er preferences, right? People are constantly choosing based on price. They're making choices on convenience and quality, high quality. They want high quality, low price, and extremely convenient. And if you notice, those three things don't quite mesh. (laughs) They don't go together. You don't get all three at once. Sorry. Uh, And when you start demanding all three at once, it cascades through the system and it gets taken out in ways that I think we all don't like to look at or think about, but it gets taken out of the environment and it gets taken out of labor. Well, you talk about this individual in the Thai shrimp industry, Tun Lin, right? He's, in the quote is, he's led to a room with 25 others. The door is opened, he's locked in. It is only now looking around at the 25 other men in the room that Tun Lin realizes something is wrong. And that something was pretty horrific, right? Yeah, yeah. Tun Lin is a trafficked migrant who essentially gets sold onto a boat. It, he becomes, I mean, there's really no other word in the English language to use but slave labor. He is beaten to work. He's not paid. He watches men around him who are his friends get killed and, and kicked off the boat. He's, he's imprisoned. Um, it's not an exchange like uh, indentured servitude where if he works long enough, he'll get off. He's just kind of captured and forced to work. Uh, and and it's, it's pretty hard to reconcile this stuff is happening and, and th- that it's connected to the supply chain. And I think what's really interesting is it's connected to the supply chain in a way that nobody wants but nobody can get rid of. And, and that's kind of a profound point. So th- let me ask this question. We all know the retail supermarket business is a very low margin business, 1% to 2%. Yes. So this is a cycle where you have to buy cheap in order 
to maintain even a, a tiny little margin to make a profit. That, that seems to be the cycle here, right? So how how does that get solved? <laughs> it's really hard. Or, or uh, it doesn't get it solved. It doesn't get solved. I mean, look, first of all, there are people working within the food industry who are desperately trying to solve this problem. And I don't mean to undercut them, but I have low confidence in most of their ability to do this at scale. Uh, the book is intentionally written without the like last chapter that every nonfiction book has where it's like, oh, and here's the solutions for a better world. Because I was like, I'm not <laughs> comfortable putting that right. in there. I don't want to be another voice saying, oh, by the way, if you just do this one thing, we can figure out how to solve everything. But I think what's been under discussed is right now the way quality and food standards are enforced in this country has largely been privatized into an audit system that is a joke. And nobody will really stand up and give a, a full throttle defense of the audit system. So we need systems in place. I think the government is probably – the place that would do that. Um, there are ways of like raising worker voice through unions and collectives that I think have some real power that don't involve the government for people who steer away from that. But, you know, we, we need to put some enforcement teeth into the food system. Right now, you can abuse people in food and like the only people who will show up are auditors. But if you're using trafficked um, labor you don't need an auditor to show up. You need a policeman to show up and you need somebody who can enforce that with the law. And I guess that's missing in this picture, like a, a regulatory structure that enforces some standards that we all believe in. OK, so so let's chat about Trader Joe's, uh, your story about Trader Joe's. I just love the story because, you know, the little guy wins. So. Um, <laughs> Trader Joe's, I'm quoting you, has the single highest sales per square foot of any retail grocery chain, basically doubling its nearest competitor, Whole Foods. It does that business while absolutely dominating rankings for customer satisfaction and employee well-being. So there are chains that really seem to be doing many things right. So could you just quickly tell the story of Trader Joe's? Sure. And, and I should caveat, like, I think Trader Joe's does uh, some amazing things, right? I don't think that any of the problems we discussed in terms of like the overseas supply chain, they do better than anyone else. Um, they're absolutely caught in that same dynamic. What Trader Joe's does right, um, well, they, <laughs> I think Joe Kalum, who founded Trader Joe's back in the mid 60s, it really approached groceries completely different from the dominant model. And he does that around quality. He does that around understanding food. And he does that more than anything by understanding the people who are going to buy Trader Joe's. So whether you love Trader Joe's or hate Trader Joe's, there is like a Trader Joe's person. I like think everyone can, can kind of like picture who the Trader Joe's person is. And Joe Kalum, who founded Trader Joe's, pictured that person obsessively. He went around and did demographic surveys of Southern California. And he took all of that and he founded his store based around some observations that he was making at the time. The biggest one of which was that the GI Bill had just passed. America was just exiting Korea and entering Vietnam, and he saw that a whole new generation of soldiers were going to be coming home from Vietnam and getting a college education, and that college-educated people were going to want new things, and they were going to become this over-educated, hmm. underpaid class of people. Well, he, he also the, – but the other thing he, you write about, which I thought was the most interesting, is – the correlation between education and alcohol consumption yes. is about as perfect as one can find in marketing. And so from booze and travel, it was just a small leap to tiki. So the first store, you know, had ship spells, oars, netting, half a rowboat. Employees wore Polynesian shirts and Bermuda shorts. The manager was called captain, the assistant manager first mate, et cetera. So he <laughs> – he really went down the rabbit hole. It wasn't just they're going to be educated and want new things. He turned that into an actual experience, right? Yes, 100%. And he got himself educated on alcohol in a way that transformed. So Trader Joe's in California was founded around alcohol, and Joe learns about it obsessively. He starts going to every vintner 
and getting bottles and then uncorking them around headquarters and they would do tastings. And, and it's it's a depth of, of food knowledge that if you're at a traditional grocer, you never develop because you're treating food like a product and you're competing for it on price. And what Joe started doing was saying, you know what? I'm not going to compete on price. I don't even want to shelve the same items that my competitors are shelving. I want to shelve items that are distinct and therefore people can't make a price judgment because they can't straight up compare it. And he does this first and foremost with wine, learning a lot about wine. But then he goes right down the line and you see it like a shift from olive oil where he can't really compete to avocado oil or peanut butter where it's absolutely impossible to compete with like Jif and Skippy. Trader Joe's is the first place to start making almond butter en masse. Um, And it really invents almond butter as a consumer item because they just couldn't compete on price with peanut butter. But they knew that this kind of overeducated, underpaid consumer would be tantalized by the idea of a slightly adjacent product like almond butter. So here's a guy who comes along and does the impossible, right? He's going to get outrun by 7-Eleven. And he just comes up with an idea where, well, hey, maybe we should give people something more interesting and something what they want and we'll charge more money because we're not competing on price and we get to pay our employees and have a decent wage, et cetera. So th- there is hope there, right? I mean, that sort of makes sense. In Costco, I just read, they have a tiny percentage of the SKUs that Walmart has, for example, yes. but they sell 15 times more of every product. Uh, yes. So th- they have unique SKUs, things that maybe are harder to find. And again, a very high wage per employee. Yeah. So those are two ex- very successful examples. Yeah, they really invent, reinvent the the gross. I mean, I could have written a book on on their or a chapter on them as well. The whole club membership scheme, where you you're not playing the game of price competition because the the person you're serving is the people who are in your club. You're in the Costco club, and the most important thing is to get the Costco club members to renew their membership. And so because then, five percent of their profits come from the membership. Exactly. And so if the club membership is like, yeah, we want to shop in a place where people make a decent wage and we don't want to have a scandal attached to this club where there's, um, you know, shrimp tainted by slave labor, like Costco has a different incentive structure for enforcing higher qualities of standards and ethics. Again, I don't think – I don't know enough about Costco, frankly, to to speak with authority on them. I don't think that they're somehow – have escaped from all the ills of of global grocery. But the the club model is is fascinating and well worth exploring. Well, on that note, on that slightly (laughs) hopeful note. (laughs) The well worth exploring, a little piece of optimism, I don't know. Well, I mean, (laughs) you know – Hundred years ago, or back in the fifties and sixties, everyone was predicting pe- millions of people would be starving by the year two thousand, yes. right? And modern agriculture and distribution supermarkets essentially solve the problem. Yeah, and also I think look, every time you walk into a supermarket, you are walking into a miracle. You are walking into something that would stagger the greatest kings, emperors right through history had nothing like this. And it's something that's right 10 minutes from your house. You walk in and you're struck by an incredible abundance. Uh, And I think there's something to be grateful for there. Even if there is an incredible dark side, um, I don't think it's responsible to overlook the miracle that it, that that does exist. Benjamin, it's been an up and down (laughs) discussion. I think we ended with an up. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. That was Benjamin Lohr, author of The Secret Life of Groceries. Supermarkets are all about choice. Some carry over 50,000 different products. Yet a study published by Harvard Health says that choice can lead to unhappiness if you have too much of it. The more choices there are, the smaller percentage that seem to be just right. Now, as a kid, I remember four TV stations, CBS, NBC, ABC, and Channel 13. The Late Show played the same movie every day for an entire week. Today, there are 599 scripted TV series, 500,000 movies, and 200 streaming services. Amazon has over 12 million products. That's why when I go out to dinner, I choose restaurants with limited menus. I just can't stand 
making the wrong choice. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. After the break, our supermarket predictions for this year. That's coming right up. I'm Christopher Kimball. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Right now, I'm joined by Andrea Hernandez to share her predictions for the grocery store this year. Andrea is the founder of Snackshot, a food and beverage newsletter on Substack. Andrea, welcome to Milk Street. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. So let's get into your list of food predictions. Uh, It's just really a great list. First off, gorgeous packaging and pretty pantry labels. You know, I see this all the time. Uh, Like with canned fish, for example, the packaging is just getting better and better. Yeah, I like to say we're living Andy Warhol's biggest dream. Like, (laughs) if you think about it, him in the 60s, he started experimenting with mundane canned goods like Campbell's, sort of like as an art. And what's crazy, and I, I, I like try to tie it back to like how millennials grew up as the Instagram generation, like everything, like the foodie culture, everything became about like signaling. And it's so funny how that culture permeated into consumer packaged goods and even so how we're building and designing our houses. So back in 2021, Pinterest like wrote about how cabinets are going out of style, what people are pinning and searching for in like their home renovations in the kitchen is like going bare shelves. And why do you want to have bare shelves is because you want your pantry items to be seen. Like the fact that we have pretty canned beans, like there's a company called Hey Day. And if you look at it, like the packaging is all pretty. It's very like millennial coded. Even Heinz and these bigger brands are updating their packaging because they realize that they can Trojan horses with aesthetics. It's like, oh, that's what millennials want. We'll give it to them. Uh, Savory drinks, veggie spritzes. (laughs) Hot sauce seltzers. I, this is something I know nothing about. <laughs> Tell me about. Yeah, so I guess it's because of the whole like anti-sugar and like sugary drink kind of like crusade. But it's been fascinating to see this sort of rise in the savory palate profile. Hmm. It's kind of like rebranding of V8, but making it millennially like cool. Um, there's this company called Savore. They're literally doing um, like carrot celery spritzes, like literally sparkling water that's like flavored with vegetables. And you have this drink called the Ourobora, this brand. They literally, for Thanksgiving last year, they launched, and it went like viral. It was so funny. They launched this um, green bean casserole spritz. I will tell you, it's surprisingly really good. And then this year they did this olive oil spritz that also tasted very briny. You obviously have the rice of pickle seltzers, pickle everything. You you mentioned here in terms of cocktails, the Peking Tom, and I, I love old fashions. It's an old fashioned made with duck confit, absinthe, and lapsing tea. I'm not sure if I really want duck confit flavor in my old fashioned, but I do like the idea of, of less sugary drinks. That's, that's good. Um, so grocery stores, you say now are brands. So yeah, there was the A&P and Cullinan's and all these other things. But now I guess you're saying like Erewhon, which by the way, in LA is, I have to say an amazing story. I, 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 went, I was out there a couple of years ago and I, every night I go back to the store for an hour and just walk around because it was so incredible. But to all of these stores now, these grocery stores as brands, do they all have a very clear point of view about merchandising and, and product selection and who they're going after? Yeah, I feel like everybody's trying to be a sort of like the Erewhon. I like to call the Erewhon followers, I like to call them snack boys. So it's like these people actually care that they're spending $22 on a jug of raw milk and they want people to know it. But, but to be fair, I, I'm, I'm going to have to defend them for a second. I, I will say that the selection of products you don't find anywhere else. And yes, insanely priced. But as a shopping experience, it is pretty amazing. Yeah, they actually have like this like sort of cohesive brand experience from like the way that they design the store, how they place their produce. The veggies have to be like aesthetically (laughs) pleasing. Yeah. And like the fact that every grocer has merch now, like it used to be like a grocery. It's a utility, right? You just go there and you get what you need. But now the whole experiential grocer kind of movement where it's like, 
the actual branded merch, the the tote bag, the like actual selfie mirror that people can post that they went like imagine your parents like taking a picture at the grocery store and like actually like that's something that is just so unheard of by the older generations, but that's so common that we have taken something that was very functional. It was like it serves this purpose. And now we've added on this like sort of experiential level to it. There's even a grocery store that I saw that's opening in Georgia that's going to have a mini golf. Because <laughs> they're like really banking on like, we want you to live inside this grocery store. So like whatever we have to do to get you to spend more time here. Well, I, you know, okay, I, I can play both sides of this. I'll argue on one hand, you know, there's no reason a grocery store has to be boring, right? I mean, you can turn anything into entertainment. And I think as a culture, we're really good at even going to the gas station, making that fun. Um, so, I, you know, I, I see no reason to criticize companies for doing that because it's, it's good business. On the other hand, it makes you think that the consumers, us, um, we don't have any other experiences in our life, right? Like, like buying stuff is about as good as it gets in terms of, you know, we're, we're not out there fishing or hunting or we're not fixing our car or we're not driving across the country or whatever we used to do. Our, our experiential life is extremely limited and maybe we've simply transposed that to the $24 miso you're buying at Erewhon, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean that, that that's, your experience is in shopping now. That's the main place other than social media. That's the main place where you're having experiences. So it's very smart business, but I think it also fills a need, right? Yeah, I do believe that. But it's so funny because I do think as our generation untethers from like organized religion, um, I actually did this whole deep dive on the rise of like spiritual beverages and snacks. So like That's you can find some chocolate bars and Whole Foods that says like this chocolate bar was made with like this hurts and it's meant to rise your vibrations. Um, there's this wow. like like Palo Santo brewed water. You can now find kava sparkling kava is like supposedly a psychoactive like root you can actually find this brand called Lalo all across New York even inside like LaGuardia but it's funny to see like the way that our generation again is really trying to bring these things that are like ancient traditions like you know instead of a shaman you have Erewhon <laughs> you know like you can just go and get it from your local grocer at this point well and some of it's pure I mean you have to go back to the late 1800s with all of these, you know, medicinals. Yeah, I joke that, you know, because of all the rise of, like, the functional drinks, like, honestly, at this point, I'm not surprised if Coke would just, like, do a whole 360 and just be like, yeah, we're putting cocaine back in Coca-Cola. <laughs> or, or hint at it. Yes, that's even better. <laughs> so it, the thing that occurs to me, if I was one of these food manufacturers, is because of social media and other things, the rate of change is now exponential, mm -hmm. right? So how do you manage a brand? I mean, just think of Kellogg's in 1896. It was two Kellogg brothers. Um, so they had a good 100-year run where things were pretty stable, at least for a lot of that time. And you could add new products, but it was a pretty predictable business. Now things change every six months, every year, every two years. I mean, three years from now, if I call you up and we have the same conversation, you're going to have a very different list of trends. So it's going to be pretty hard for food manufacturers to create new lines, design everything, get shelf space, and then two years later, whoops, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> CMOS is, has, has fallen off the radar screen. Yeah, it's really interesting because the – snack daddies, like I like to refer to them, or big food companies, they're realizing now like they can't innovate fast enough. Like you said, everything's changing so fast. Like, oh, everybody's doing adaptogenic nut butters. OK, let's try to do our, ourselves. Um, and so like they realize that they can't innovate fast enough. So they are like shedding things. And I actually spoke to someone at Pepsi Ventures about this. It was really interesting because they're like, we're going to wait it out. <laughs> they're like, we're before we get into, you know, I don't think Pepsi's going to be like launching uh, you know, uh, a sea moss drink anytime soon because they actually are trying to see whether is this a fat or not. So like a lot of these snack daddies are realizing like, oh, we could also just see if things reverse and just go back to how things were. So I guess just give it time. Andrea, this was, this was fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. 
That was Andrea Hernandez, founder of Snack Shop. That's it for this week's show. Please don't forget you can find more than 250 episodes of Milk Street Radio wherever you get your podcasts. You can find more about Milk Street at 177milkstreet.com. There you can become a member, access our online cooking classes, and get free shipping on all orders from the Milk Street store. You can also learn about our latest cookbook, Milk Street Simple. Please check us out on Facebook at Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, on Instagram at 177 Milk Street. We'll be back next week, and thanks, as always, for listening. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is produced by Milk Street in association with GBH. Co-founder, Melissa Baldino. Executive producer, Annie Sinsabaugh. Senior editor, Melissa Allison. Producer, Sarah Clapp. Associate producer, Caroline Davis, with production help from Debbie Paddock. Additional editing by City Lewis. Audio mixing by Jay Allison at Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Theme music by Chewbop Crew. Additional music by George Brindle Egloff. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is distributed by PRX. PRX.